the next hour uh, really looks, uh, looks equally as exciting for us. All of you and all of us have used the word team and teamwork and multidisciplinary over and over and over again this morning already. So we want to role model that, and we've uh, put together a wonderful group of uh, people to form our panel for some questions and answers, and they're going to introduce themselves as we get to it. But uh, they're a great group of people. My friend, Dr. Kui Tran, who's a palliative care uh, physician at the VA hospital, Esther Lara, who works in our Alzheimer's Disease Center, Jenna Corman, who uh, I know and is one of the oncology social workers, and Faith Glisson, who's a chaplain in, uh, in our UC Davis uh, hospice program and has uh, been the chaplain for our family during, uh, during our terminal illness uh, in my mother-in-law's family and others. So it's a great group. And so we've got many of your questions here. And uh, Annie, what's the first question? Question number one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So Faith, again, you know, we all love Faith. In your experience, what are the most common regrets, and concerns, and hopes of the seriously ill? OK. So what are the most common concerns, regrets, maybe one other, is there uh, needs of the terminally ill? I want to tell you that. Um, I really appreciated the uh, presentation on caregivers because a lot of times the patients themselves, their biggest concern is about the caregivers, their family, their children. Um, in fact, one family that I was with, the woman, I met with her and I said, you know, Shirley, do you have any concerns, any unfinished business? And she, she thought about it for a minute and she said, well, I have just one right now. And I said, well, what is it? She said, I'm worried about my husband. And so I thought she was going to go into this long dissertation about, you know, that he was in fear or anxiety. She said, who's going to feed him? I've cooked every meal of his life. That was her concern. It was real. And so it's important for me as a chaplain not to assume that I know what somebody's concerns are, but rather to come alongside them. The other thing about regrets, um, in the presentations we've heard about anger, resentment, should-haves, could-haves, and oftentimes my goal is to help people to find purpose in their life because by helping them find purpose, they end up letting go of the resentment and the anger, which are exactly, in my humble opinion, what leads to the regret. So just helping people to find purpose in their life, helping them to explore and understand God, their higher powers, they know them. That's what's really important to people, their biggest concerns. Family, children, and then unfinished business. And what meaning has their life had? Okay, I think that's really great. Tell us a little bit more about yourself and what is a chaplain in the UC Davis hospice program do? Okay, how long do I have? 45 <laughs> seconds? Yeah, 45 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> okay, well just a little bit about myself real quick. Um, I actually come from the telecommunications background where I served for 22 years and one of the things that called me was that I always noticed I had people coming to my door who wanted to talk. And so I, I received a calling um, about nine years ago into chaplaincy. I didn't know what a chaplain did or who they were, but I had a calling. And so I went to school. I actually went to school in Ohio, and I was a volunteer for four years with Hospice of Southwest Ohio, where I really understood and came to, to want to be a hospice chaplain. So I did a year residency here in California at UC Davis. I'm actually a resident of California. And I have been with UC Davis Hospice for two and a half years. Thank you. Thank you, Faith. So Dr. Tran, give us a little bit about yourself. And, and something I've always been interested in and, and someone in the audience asked about, what happens when people are enrolled in hospice and they get better? 
It, how often does that happen, and what what do we do about that? So tell us about yourself, and tell us about what happens when when people get better. And you may have to pull that microphone. I may closer. have. To, I have. I'm mic'd oh, you got your mic so up. I, okay, I very I good. I think I'm good. So um, my my actually my my background. I was a uh, uh, environmental engineer by training. Um, so I worked on uh, actually with the Department of Water Resources for some time, and, and now I'm here doing doing this. <laughs> so the the path was a little bit windy to get here, but I'm here. Uh, I have training in oncology, um, so I'm a medical oncologist in palliative medicine as well too. And on the side, I do some of hospital-based medicine as well too, just for fun. Um, that's a great question about what happens if you, we call this um, um, graduating hospice or uh, <laughs> the, the failure to die syndrome, which, which does happen. <laughs> uh, which does, does happen on, on, on occasion. I actually tell patients this, that you know, um, doctors have the type A personality where we hate being wrong all the time for whatever reason. We just have a really bad feeling when we're wrong. But I actually tell patients that the times when I'm wrong for my patient population, I give them high fives because that means you have more time. That means that you get to spend more time with family. You get to do what you want to do, and that's okay if we're wrong about things. Now, in my field of oncology, we're not wrong that often, but on occasion for other disease states for like dementia or stuff, it's really hard to predict sometimes exactly when somebody may pass. Um, but when we're wrong, that's okay. So we do graduate patients off of hospice. Um, we just say, we're still here. If you still need us, you can do use our palliative care services, which is just an extension of that. And we'll still follow along and at some point in time when hospice becomes appropriate again, um, then we'll come back and, and provide those services. Well, I know you're a big advocate that actually hospice helps people live longer. Mm -hmm. And I, I know in my early days in, in the 1980s when hospice was made up of 35% of our patients had HIV, yeah. that, that the nurses and I and the social workers, chaplain, everybody, we were convinced that people came on to hospice and they actually got better even with uncontrolled AIDS. And we would graduate them and they'd get worse and then come back on a hospice and get better. So we're kind of convinced, some of us, that hospice helps people to not only live better, but live longer. They do live longer. So Dr. McMillan gave that great chart in which patients with cancer receiving all the therapies surrounding cancer, in addition, getting palliative care actually live longer, about three months longer, so on average. Um, but that's about the same amount of time as most of our new drugs you guys hear about and the, you know, all the drugs you know, on the commercials and everything. We get really excited. I get patients who get really excited. go, what's that new drug they're showing on the Super Bowl? I want that drug, <laughs> right? And that's about a three-month addition to their life. But when the data came out for palliative care can add an additional three months of life, and this is what we all do, there's no Super Bowl ad for that, mm -hmm. right? There's no Super Bowl ad for that. Um, but it's, it's care that we can provide for everybody, and it's care that I think is, it should be pretty much defined as standard of care now, for the most part. Um, and I think all of you will hopefully go back to your physicians and demand, you know, where's my standard of care, palliative care? That's the best care that I want. Yeah, I think that's a really important, poignant point. Th this is standard of care. It's not experimental anymore. It's not, it is... It's proven best quality. Mm -hmm. Jenna, what strategies have you found to be most effective for dealing with grief uh, and in a serious illness or a life-threatening illness? And, and, and how, how, do we, how do we cope? We haven't used that word this morning too much, but tell us about effective coping uh, when dealing with any serious or life-threatening illness. And tell us about yourself and how you came to do this work. Okay, my name's Jenna, and I'm a social worker, an oncology social worker across the street at the Cancer Center. Um, I, I've been a social worker for about 16 years, and I started my career in uh, pediatrics and OBGYN, and through the course of these 16 years, I've slowly worked myself through, through the lifespan, and I've ended up in oncology, which is where I feel like I, that's, the, that's where, I've ended up where I'm supposed to be. Um, I, uh, I've always argued that, I, that social work is palliative care because our whole purpose is to focus on quality of life and help the people that we, that we uh, meet with live fully 
and live with meaning and with purpose. Um, so uh, to the question, how, did, how do we help people cope with grief? Well, I think the first thing that we do and that we recommend to other folks who are helping their loved one, who are grieving themselves or who are helping their families uh, cope with grief is to just listen. Um, grief is something that is very personal. It looks different for all of us. We all have different ways of expressing our grief. Um, and there's no right or wrong way to do that. So the first thing that we can do is just listen to our loved one and, and really hear what it is that they're trying to tell us uh, without judgment, without trying to, um, without input, without, um, without advice. And that can be really difficult sometimes because when we see our loved ones in pain, our first response naturally is to want to fix it and want to make it go away. And there are some things that we, we just can't fix. Um, something that I think is, is a, good, a good thing to practice but also difficult is just uh, to be present, to stay in the present, and to be really honest with our loved ones. And when I say stay in the present, I, I really mean be in that moment. It's, it's tempting to want to look back and think of things that we could have changed or things that we could have done differently. Um, and it's also tempting to want to look forward and say, you know, it's to say things that we think are, might be comforting, like it's going to be okay. Things are going to get better. And the truth is that we don't always know if things are going to be okay or if they're going to get better. Maybe they will. But we don't know that, and so th that's the honest part that I think is is difficult. Some honest things that we can say are, I love you, I'm here for you, I know you're in pain, and it's difficult for me to see you be in pain, but I'm here for you. Um, that's an easy thing to say, it's a harder thing to do. Uh, as a as a social worker, one of the things that I often talk to with patients is I ask them a lot of questions, um, questions about what are, what are the things that are concerning to you? What are the things, are there things that you are fearing right now? Are there people that you are concerned about? Um, my first goal is to find out what, what does all this mean for you? I know what it would mean for me, but I'm not you. So I want to I want to understand what this experience is for for the people that we meet with, and then once we have an understanding of that, then we can then we can try and and work towards those things. If I am meeting with someone who is gravely ill, and maybe it's a mom who has small kids, and maybe her illness is keeping her from spending time with her children the way she would want to. Um, then that really directs what we do. Then our goal becomes, okay, how do we help you spend as much time that you can with your kids or your loved ones or the, whoever are the important people in your life? Um, so I would say, you know, it's really, it's really about listening and, and letting, letting your loved one direct. Great. Thank you. Uh, can Jana, I add one more? Great. Please. So one of the things that I've, that I've found is that grief can can present in many different ways, and maybe we can ask your opinion as well too. As mm -hmm. a physician, often in oncology, um, grief may not present as, you know, I'm having a hard time helping my loved one, but may present as, why is it that I'm not getting the next drug? You have more, right? And, and sometimes it's hard for us as providers to recognize that, that it, it, it could be a sign of, of grief. Are there ways to sort of help family members themselves recognize that they may be grieving um, whereas the outward expression of it may, may not be the typical one that we, we see. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, I can only speak to how I handle things like that. I mean, I, I typically allow, I typically let families 
take the lead. I follow where people go. So if, if a family, if, if someone is expressing okay. anger or frustration about how the, the medical piece is going or why they are or are not getting a treatment that they think will do this or will do that, then, then my tactic is to assist them in, you know, so you know, how do we communicate these concerns with your medical team? And with other people on your team, what are what are the what are the what's the information that you need that you don't have right now? Because typically, if folks are, if they're expressing anger and frustration, my experience is that that's typically because there's something that they don't understand. Mm -hmm. Maybe they've gotten information that they don't like, or it's not what they wanted to hear, and maybe once they, maybe they're never going to get the answer that they want to hear, but if we can help them ask the questions of their medical team um, so that they do have the information, so that they can better understand why it is that their doctors have recommended what they've recommended, that could, they still might not get the answer they want or that they're hoping for, but now they understand where that, why that direction has been recommended, and now they can better make decisions that make sense for them. They've got all the information that they need. And, and I would add that one of the things that we, that's important and we try to do is encourage, and I've heard it this morning, is to advocate for yourself. To advocate, we also encourage patients to empower themselves, to use their voice, to talk to their team. And then we also, as Jenna said, we help them through the journey we try to understand why they're interested in this medication, what do they understand about their disease, and, and why, what's the underlying concern. Um, I'd also like to just add one thing about hospice and uh, grief. When a family comes on to hospice with their loved one and the loved one passes, most hospice programs offer 15 months of bereavement for the family. And that's really important to know because while the patient is alive, you may not take that time to grieve, but it's there or to cry. And so we have social workers that are part of our team that work with families after their loved one has passed. And you can meet individually, you can meet with groups, we have children's therapy groups. So again, each hospice program is different but it's a part of the grieving process and care that we offer. Great. I think that we want to come back to that. Esther, you, uh, you're from our Alzheimer's Disease Center, and uh, a number of us uh, have a question for you. There are several questions, and I have the same question. My mom died of dementia. Uh, it's just very hard to see all the time the value of being alive when you have advanced dementia and yet we don't really want to lose our loved one. We're really conflicted. There's a lot of guilt about wanting the dementia to be over because now we're thinking about ourselves, not our loved one. It's a, lot, it's a cauldron of emotion. It was for me. I think it is for people in the audience. Help us. And tell us about yourself at the same time. <laughs> in two minutes, right? <laughs> Three minutes. And I think, is your microphone so. on? Hold that right up there. I, I think there it's on. Um, my name is Esther Lara. I work for the Alzheimer's Disease Center. I've been there about 22 years now. It's a privilege for me to work with this generation. I love working with seniors. And um, a lot of people often say, oh, it's so, it must be so sad to work at the Alzheimer's Disease Center. But I actually um, feel very privileged because we're able to really help families um, through the journey of Alzheimer's disease, if you can name it that. Um, you know, we had an excellent talk this morning about caregiving. We don't talk enough about caregiving. Um, and often, even in the medical field, caregivers are neglected. Um, this morning, we were privileged to hear a speaker talk about caregivers and always making caregivers her patients as well, but that's not always the case. 
Um, Alzheimer's disease is a devastating disease because it takes away all of our abilities and very gradually. So this disease can last many, many years. Um, at the same time, caregivers are becoming more and more isolated because of the demands of caregiving. And certainly caregiving has very rewarding moments. You know, people that do caregiving, the one or two ch child that does caregiving or that spouse that decides to do caregiving, you know, it's, it's truly in their heart to do it. And it's very rewarding. We all appreciate that gift. But it's a hard one. It is very hard. Um, changing your parents' diapers or your spouse's diapers is not natural, and it doesn't feel good. And so when those feelings come that you feel, oh, my God, it would be better for them to die. And then along with that comes like, how can I be such a bad spouse or such a bad child? How can I be thinking that? But in reality, you're thinking it because you love them and you don't want them to continue to suffer this way. And at the same time, you don't want to continue to suffer this way. So it's, what I would say is, how many caregivers are, do we have in the room today? How many have cared for someone? Okay, so a good number of us, right? And then of those, how many of you, while you were caregiving, had that thought? Raise your hand. Be brave. <laughs> yes, exactly. See, we're not alone. Very often when that feeling comes, we feel like we're the only ones with that feeling. But once I start telling you, you know what? I hear that very often, and I totally understand how you would feel that way. Then it's like, oh my God. It doesn't have to be a secret anymore. I can let it out and actually talk to someone about it. I think also when it comes to Alzheimer's disease, as a society, we want to help, but very often seniors become very isolated, not only the caregiver, but the person with the disease. You know, we tend to, as friends, not go out with them as much anymore, not invite them to go to dinner or lunch, or even come over and sit with them so that their caregivers can get a break. And I don't know why that happens. It kind of happened with AIDS, you know? And I often tell seniors, it, it's kind of happening with Alzheimer's too, you know? And so as a society, I think, if you have a friend that does have Alzheimer's, you know, it's nice to ask the caregiver, what can I do for you? But even better, say, on Tuesday, I'm coming over, and I'm bringing lunch, and I'm going to be with him or with her for two hours. So plan whatever you need to plan. I will be here. That way, it's more of an effort in your part, and they don't have to actually say, yes, I accept you help doing this for me, which caregivers have a really hard time doing. It's really hard for caregivers to one, hire a housekeeper, a gardener, and even harder to tell their children, I do need help. Or even more, their friends, I do need help. I often tell caregivers, we save our money for a rainy day. Alzheimer's disease means a sprinkling already. It is raining on you. Start getting some respite. Start paying for some of those services. But on the other hand, as a society, we also don't have the resources to help families pay for respite. We, don't, we are not prepared for the wave that we are now facing with Alzheimer's disease and the aging. And we as a society don't want to pay for services. So, I don't know, next time you vote, ask your, your politician, <laughs> what are you going to do for Alzheimer's? <laughs> and for caregivers. So. Great. Thanks, Esther. That was great. So, Dr. McMillan, maybe Dr. Garoni, someone asked about um, access to palliative care, both on the inpatient and outpatient areas. And, you know, access is one of those 
quality of care issues, timely access, which I was boasting about. But, but how do you get access to palliative care uh, on the inpatient unit, and how do you get it in, in the outpatient setting? So I think uh, it was mentioned that access is related to your health care system. I can only speak to Kaiser Permanente. In Kaiser Permanente, across Northern California, every single one of our 22 hospitals has an inpatient palliative care team. So if you know of somebody who's inpatient at Kaiser Permanente and you're worried about what's going on, just tell them to ask for And, and that works because I actually activated that system through Dr. Garoni a couple of months ago for a friend patient, so yeah. it works. In Sacramento, uh, here in the North Valley, so Roseville, Sacramento, we have um, palliative care consultations in our emergency room. We have a clinic one and a half days a week. We have outpatient telephonic consultations five days a week, and I'm going to nursing homes two days a week. So it really is just a matter in Kaiser of, of asking the doctor, and we can make an electronic referral easy peasy. So here at Davis, I think we're a little behind uh, our colleagues at Kaiser. Um, we have a, in a robust inpatient palliative care service. Um, so certainly any patient who's hospitalized uh, within our hospital, um, families can just ask for a consult, and we will be happy to come over and see the patient. Uh, you know, it, uh, I'm happy to say, you know, illness affects our pediatric patient population. So we have our colleagues in pediatrics are in the process of forming their pediatric palliative care services. So if any of you have family members who may need that for a child, uh, certainly uh, please call for that. I think we're trying to move palliative care into the outpatient arena. I think that's where the future of medicine is rather than waiting till you're so sick in the hospital is planning ahead. Uh, Dr. Fairman has a uh, psycho-oncology clinic over in the cancer center that does a lot of uh, palliative care intervention with our oncology patients, but he's just one man with a half day of clinic a week, I think. So we are exploring um, in our hospice program here at UC Davis, we're actually piloting a project of a home-based palliative care program where we're paid, these are for patients who aren't ready for hospice, but they don't qualify for home health services so, but they're dealing with chronic illnesses, and we're trying to model that over the next year to develop a financial uh, model that's sustainable that we can go to our health system and and uh, be able to say, hey, th this is a model to to be able to meet the needs of our patient. The next step will at some point figuring out how do we do clinic. Yeah, I just want to make a comment because I think this will be helpful for you. Um, I think there's two ways to think about expanding access to palliative care, and one is by um, increasing the number of palliative care experts and spreading them out. So that's what uh, Jack and Shelley are mentioning, that we've got, at least at UC Davis right now, all our palliative care expertise, or most of it is in the hospital, and we're but we're trying to increase that and spread it out. But the other thing we're doing and other institutions are doing as well is we're trying to improve what's called primary palliative care, and that means the core palliative care skills that your primary care doctor can provide, and um, other clinicians in your clinics can provide. And that's, that's an educational um, process, and it's a process that we're doing at UCD to help train medical students and residents and other doctors and nurses and social workers and chaplains in providing palliative, primary palliative care where they are. So that's, that's the next part of expansion of palliative care, and that's happening too. And I'll just add that uh, in, addition, in addition to best care and the altruism that we've been talking about today, Medicare and other health plans are really aligning how they reimburse health systems with palliative care, uh, and that the, the, the usefulness of palliative care, the reimbursement for palliative care will align with Medicare and other health plan uh, reimbursements, and, and I think that's going to be the next uh, transformation. So uh, stay tuned for a lot more. Actually, can I add one more for the... You can the, add one, anything one you more want to. The, so that for, the, for, for those of you who have um, loved ones that are veterans, um, the VA has been a real leader in providing palliative care, one of the, the biggest organizations that provides palliative care in the United States. Mm -hmm. Basically, here in the Northern California area, we have a fully integrated outpatient, inpatient palliative care service and also home-based palliative care. Mm -hmm. And we also have a 16-bed inpatient hospice mm -hmm. unit that we provide for our veterans mm -hmm. as well, too. And so whether a patient is, can come to the clinic, whether they're in the hospital, whether they need services in an inpatient hospice, or whether they need care at home, 
uh, the VA can provide uh, care for veterans that need palliative care in a fully integrated way. Great. Well, that's so. I think all the healthcare systems are really putting together nice systems to help you, and you're helping us by driving the demand for this. So, so somebody asked a really great question. We're going to ask Dr. Tran to answer this initially, and also my friend and colleague, Dr. Tony Cantelmi, who was chair of medicine at Kaiser while I was chair of medicine here. He was a little longer chair of medicine than I was, and now runs the addiction center at Kaiser. So, so you know. Compulsive drug abuse, addictions in our society are pretty common. <laughs> Alcohol, heroin, amphetamines, it, it just happens. And, it's, and, and we don't think of that in a pejorative way necessarily. It's, it's pretty common. And, and, uh, and yet, as we enter palliative care and end-of-life care, we rely on medicines a great deal to palliate symptoms. We use narcotics. We use sedative hypnotics. We sometimes prescribe marijuana. We, in the past, have used stimulants like amphetamines to overcome some of the side effects. So we're, we, we uh, draw on the pharmacy a great deal. So, Qui, Tony, tell us, how do, how do we balance, particularly in people with a history of compulsive yeah. abuse, addictions, with our prescribing of these medicines? It seems like this is a... Uh, a, a setup for family, patient, doctor conflict. Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. Whoever yeah. asked that, that was a really great question. <laughs> that was question. a really smart <laughs> question. Who yeah. asked that question out there? That, that's, uh, that, that's the one that we've come up uh, quite, a, quite a bit, actually, in this sort of day and age. You hear a lot in the news now about uh, opioid addiction and that's abuse, uh, as well as um, abuse of other substances as well. And so when abuse... Uh, intersects with serious illness or hospice care, that, that, can, that can bring up a lot of issues, not only with the family, but the providers, as well as um, the patient themselves. And so that's something that we do need to address. I, I sort of look at it two ways. There's two parts to that particular question. One is there's an emotional, psychological component of it. Somebody's sort of fear of using a particular substance in which they may themselves have abused. And then the second part of it, sort of the medical medical part of it. And so as a palliative care provider, I always wonderfully ask my colleagues to help me with the psychological component because things such as depression as well as addiction, in my world, in the Veterans Administration, PTSD is a, a component of it as well, too. So I ask their, their help in addressing that component. From a medical point, the way I explain it to, to families is that there are some things that I may need to use that's required. Um, and everything that we do or use in medicine has a plus side and a minus side, and that includes even the uh, substances of abuse. So for example, in my world in, in medical oncology, I'm, I'm flirting with a very thin line of benefit of a drug and death from the drug. Very, very thin line that I have to work with. And so the same thing with opioids or any other medications that we use. There's a thin line between what's the benefit of it and what's the downside of that. Um, I had a patient one time who um, I admitted to an inpatient hospice unit, and he had an a opioid addiction problem, and he was deathly against, I am not going to use morphine. Mm -hmm. You know, I abused heroin my whole life. I am not touching that morphine. And, and no matter how I explained it, it was just, I'm not using it. You know, I don't care how much pain I have. You can give me Tylenol. That's it. I'm not going to use it anymore. But when I sat down and talked to him about sort of his fears and all the things that were going on, he was a really religious person. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if this was a, just something just popped in my mind. Because, you know, morphine, I said, well, morphine is the derivative of opioids it, from the opium plant, right? It grows naturally. Yeah, God put it there. <laughs> yeah, why would God give us opium and allow us to make morphine, right? To, right, to ease our, <laughs> e ease our transition to the other world. And so as I got to talking with him in terms of his fears and his re religiosity, is that a word? Um, we got to sort of understanding that there are some things in this world that are there for our benefit as well, too. And if we use it correctly, we can ease our transition to a different place. And that helped him overcome his fear of using a drug. And so, um, I mean, the sort of different story, you probably hear the same thing yourself. But it, I, was, I was a 
a budding chaplain, I think, at that time. <laughs> and so <laughs> it worked for me. No matter how medically inclined the explanation was, that didn't work, but it, it, that seemed to work for me. So. That's great. Our pharmacist is part of that team so that we can share and voice patients, loved ones' concerns and the side effects or reactions that are happening to best care for that family and patient. The, the so. word that you use, addiction, comes up a, a lot, definitely. Um, I, the way I explain it is that um, I would never tell a, a person who has diabetes that they're addicted to insulin, right? Their body needs insulin for a particular purpose. And so when people are at end of life or in pain, addiction doesn't happen at the mm -hmm. end of life, and we use pain medications for a particular purpose. Yes. And so people at the end of life are not addicted to pain medications. We're using it for a purpose, just like basic people with diabetes are using insulin for a purpose. They're not addicted to mm -hmm. it. They need it. Great. Okay. Dr. Ken, tell me we're going to let you uh, run. run with this. <laughs> Thank you, Fred. That was uh, unexpected. Um, <laughs> See, he's got good diplomacy skills, already, too. Unexpected. Already, yes, indeed. Well, you know, addiction just doesn't know any boundaries. And so um, just because you're a methamphetamine user or an opioid abuser or heroin addict, you still get diseases that, that will make you die or cause you your death. So what we've found or what I've typically found is negotiation is, is one of the big aspects of dealing with this because... We've treated methamphetamine abuse because they have not only they not only get a cancer just like anyone else, but they'll get heart disease, um, you know, a congestive heart failure and that. And negotiating with them is actually pretty pretty incredible because most of them, by the time they get the the terminal illness, will have will have rectified a lot of their wild behavior, and they're either off the stuff or they're still really into it. In which case, they know that they're dying now and that their medicines are used in a different light. So I find, and we find, we encourage our physicians that are dealing with this is to make sure you have a very clear plan. What we call, instead of contracts, we still, even with end-of-life patients, we'll have safety agreements so that everybody has a real idea of exactly what it is. You're not to sell these drugs. You're not to do this. And, you know, what, is your, what are your options with somebody who's got a, a cancer in their bone that, that still abuses? You're going to have to give them much smaller numbers. You have to watch them closer. But I find the ones that we've had uh, at Kaiser Permanente, they've been very respectful, and uh, the families are very respectful. And I don't actually see a relief more than I do of a fear of, of that as long as you have the right, um, the right mindset and you treat them with dignity, which is what everyone deserves, and you negotiate. And I think that's, that's what we do hopefully pretty well. Great. Thanks, Thanks for... Tony. So, Faith, I'm going to kick it back to you. Um, <laughs> So, not everybody's religious. No, they're not. And, and so I wonder, you know, in, in hospice or in the hospital, do, when do you see patients? Do you see all patients? What about people who aren't religious? What, how do you, uh, what, what's the role of chaplaincy in that situation? Okay, so I'm going to talk about hospice, religion, and spirituality. So first of all, the chaplain is part of the healthcare team for each family. But when the initial patient is opened and their family into the hospice care, uh, the social worker goes through a questionnaire, and one of them is about spirituality. And the, he or she social worker will ask the family if they're interested in chaplain. About 50% of the time, families will opt for chaplain care. So I'm going to talk about those who do, and then I'm going to cover about those who don't. So as a chaplain, um, religion and spirituality. First of all, there are patients who will say that they profess a specific faith or religious group. There are others who say they're not religious, but they have a spirituality. They believe in a divine power. They believe in something, some higher power, maybe not even necessarily God. Um, so the first thing that I would like to define, and I talk to patients about this, because when I do come, they'll say, well, chaplain, um, I believe in God, but I don't belong, belong to any church, or I don't profess any specific faith. So I read a book one time, probably about five years ago, and it was wonderful because it taught that what religion tends to separate, spirituality binds together. And that's what I tell patients. I come from a place of spirituality. 
religion is their religion, and if they want me to call their pastor, or they want a ritual, or they want to talk about the commandments or have the Bible read, whatever, they would like, that's up to them. I let them guide me. But most often, the talks are about spirituality. Who are they? Who is this God for them? They want to explore the nature and the presence of God in their lives. They want to, most people aren't so much afraid of dying or of death itself, but rather of dying. What will happen at the end of life? I had a gentleman, uh, Bill, who loved redwood trees, although he had never seen a redwood tree in his life. Very religious man. Um, he was 99 years old. And when I came, we would talk, and he said to me one day, I said, do you have, you know, how's it going today? And he said, well, you know, I've been thinking. And I said, about what? And he said, well, you know, I'm 99 years old. Yes. He said, and I'm wondering, what am I going to do when I get to heaven and I can't find my loved ones because there's got to be millions and billions of people there now. And I said, yes. And he said, and... What if I don't even, what if there's no room for me? Because there's so many people of God. This was a dilemma for him. I knew he loved redwoods. So I said to him, can you, can you go with me to the base of a redwood for just a minute? And although he'd never seen one, he said, sure. And I said, look up and tell me what you see. What do you see in the redwood? And he said, well, I see the trunk, and I see the needles, and I could hear things up there. I said, can you see everything? He said, I can't see everything, but I know there's a lot of things in there. I said, is it possible that heaven is like this redwood tree? You can't see everything that's in there, but you know it's there. And there's room for every bug, for every ant, for every bird, for every nest, and it soars to the skies in heaven. And he said, I hadn't thought about it that way. I suppose so. So here was a man who had a religion, but he was also looking at spirituality. He was trying to figure out where he fit. And even for people who don't have a religion or have a spirituality, maybe they're atheists. Some will say, well, I, I don't know what I believe. I don't believe in anything. And that's OK, too. Because as a chaplain, I'm not there to judge. I'm not there to prophesize. You know, oftentimes people think that a chaplain just goes in and prays. That's okay. I really don't need a microphone to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just say that. <laughs> Jack can tell you that. <laughs> um, anyway, most people, most people really, um, or an atheist, anybody who doesn't necessarily proclaim a faith, they believe in something. They believe their life has a purpose. They're not really sure where they're going to go at the end of life, but they think there's something out there. And they don't, they don't want to be prophesied to. They don't want to be prayed to. And even when I offer prayer, I always ask people, what would you like to pray for? What's important to you? And so as a chaplain, the other thing that I would just like to share when I said people who do request chaplain and people who don't, the families that don't ask for chaplain initially, usually about two-thirds of the way through, the nurse or the social worker will say, you know what, Faith? I think this family could really use you. They're complaining about pain, but it's not physical pain. It's emotional pain or mental pain. And it affects them in an entirely different way. And no matter how many prescriptions or changes we make to their medicines, it doesn't touch it until I go sit at their bedside and ask them, so what's going on? What's in your heart? What's troubling you? And so that's one way that I go to the home. Sometimes it's on the last day. The bottom line is, though, it doesn't matter when I get there or any chaplain gets there for that matter, because it's really up to the patient and the family. But I'm always there to come alongside them and be there to support them in whatever way they need. And that's truly the role of a chaplain, to be there for the staff, to be there for the families, and to be there at the end of life as well. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Faith. And that's why she's our chaplain.
And I'm such a good MC, I drew her out of her shyness, and she's really been able to talk a little bit. So, are, Jenna, so Jenna, let's uh, let's try to build on faith comment about finding something in everybody to help them through an illness. That was that was very eloquent faith. But there are patients who we see who just say they're giving up. They just have no reason to go on. Leave me alone. I just can't do this. How, how do we? How do we? How, what, how do we respond to that? What's the way forward in the patient who, who says they've given up and that they just can't do it anymore? Well, I think the first thing you have to assess is where is this? Where is this coming from? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, sometimes we have patients who, you know, it, if when you're going through a chronic or terminal illness, it's not uncommon to develop mental health symptoms, depression, anxiety. So the first thing we want to really assess is, is what you're saying coming out of feelings of depression and anxiety? And if so, is there something that we can do about that? And if we did do something about that, would you still feel the same way? Okay, so that's... Uh, now, sometimes patients really are, um, really are suffering and really have, um, you know, symptoms going on that for them are more than they want to manage. They, they are at the point where this is not quality of life anymore. And so it's hard to tease out for those patients, you know, it, if this is something that has to do with mental health, then we want to treat that and give you an opportunity to look at this in a different light. But if this is, if this is due to something due to, let's say, some physical symptoms that are not being managed well, well, I mean, that's kind of why we're all here then, to talk, is to talk about palliative care. And are there things that, w that your medical team or the rest of us can be doing to help manage those symptoms? So it's really, it's really about communication. What, when you say to me, I can't do this anymore, I want to know what exactly does that mean? What, what is it that is unbearable for you? And are there things that we can do to make it more bearable? Yeah, I, I really agree with you. I think that it, it becomes an existential crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and it's really a problem. And Dr. Fairman, people don't want to write another chapter in that book you keep teaching me about. They don't want to write a story. So what do we just respect that? Because patient, you're an advocate for patient autonomy, which I I respect and love, and it, and do we just stop at that point? Um, I think I think the situation you're just I, I understand the situation you're describing in a, in three ways. There are three words that are helpful for me. One is um, demoralization. The patients become demoralized. Another is discouraged, and another is despair. And those, those are interesting words because they get at the heart of the situation for a patient like that. Demoralization, the, the core word is moral. And morals have to do with what's right and wrong. So someone who's demoralized has lost the sense that their life is right. They, they feel like to live is wrong. They're demoralized. Discouragement, the core word is cour from the French, which means heart. You're disheartened. And despair, the core word is also from French, it's espoir, which means hope or spirit. Your spirit is lost, your hope is lost. And so the task in that situation for a really good clinician is to lean forward and to find out what it is about their situation that's caused them to lose hope, to lose contact with their spirit, to become disheartened, and to see if there are things that we can do to reconnect them to those things, to reconnect them to the purpose that exists in their life, to the meaning that they have. And when we can do that, it requires a big team. It requires a specialist in symptom management for their physical symptoms. It requires a specialist in their spiritual care. It requires a, special, a specialist in their practical care, a social worker. Um, and I would say, even in situations where we can't fix all of those things that are causing them to despair, one of the most useful things we can do is to witness to them. Sometimes patients themselves 
can understand. I know that these things that trouble me can't be fixed, but I need someone to witness that. I need someone to hear me and to sit with me and to see me and to say that I see you and respect you. I understand that you're suffering and I'm going to stay with you and do what I can to help. That, that kind of witnessing alone is something that's often helpful. So that's, that's not a, none of that is practical, by the way, but all of it matters a lot to patients. Thanks, Dr. Fairman. I'm, I, I think that last comment, uh, which I learned from my social worker mentors, to bear witness is uh, remarkably profound and important. And I think that's what we've done today together, all of us in this room. We've been able to bear witness to an important part of our lives, uh, an important part of our families' lives. Uh, and it's very profound, and it's, it's, uh, I feel very uh, uh, optimistic about all of you and about all of my colleagues, and uh, it kind of reinforces why I think uh, you know, this is what we've committed ourselves to. Dr. Hargadon, you want to make a last comment? Uh, and uh, we're going to wrap things up for the day. Thank you. So um, there's still a handful of questions here that we didn't get to, and I apologize for that. They're wonderful questions. So if you asked one that, that we didn't have time to answer, come on up and give me your email, and I'll do my best to make sure that it gets answered. Um, and I want to thank all of our outstanding panelists for your expertise and your time, our speakers. Thank you so much. It was just wonderful having you here. And Dr. Myers, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And all of you, it's fantastic. A lot of my friends, my mom is here. <laughs> um, so thank you very much, all of you, for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.